Okay. Okay, we uh, we are now live with another um, talk today as part of the Open Neuroscience and Worldwide Neuro Initiative, where we are highlighting open source tools for neurosciences. Um, if you have a talk or if you have a project that you would like to uh, highlight, please reach out to us at Open Neuroscience so that we can get it um, up on the website for you and set up a talk. Uh, the links are on the description of this video and also on the chat now. Um, we would like to thank um, the organizers of Worldwide Neuro for this opportunity and for this amazing series that they've set up for all these branches in, in science. And also our speaker today, Marius um, Pachitadio, I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, who is a group leader at Janilia since 2017, when today he's going to be speaking about Kilosort which is a tool for spike sorting. Uh, Marius actually has um, got a, a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Princeton, where um, he discovered computational neuroscience during that time, as far as I understand. And what he fastly realized was that he didn't have enough skills uh, to work on computational neuroscience, which was what he wanted. So he had to learn uh, machine learning, which this is why he went to uh, University College London uh, to do a PhD at the Gatsby Unity uh, under the supervision of Manish uh, Sahani. Um, and then he interacted with a broad community there. Um, and upon graduating, he stayed at UCL for a postdoc uh, with Kenneth Harris and Matteo Carandini. And uh, this is where he first performed actually experiments and started developing Kilosort and Sweet2P. If you have been following our series, you saw last week a talk about Sweet2P. And if you didn't, then make, take a time, take a little time to watch the talk because it's great. Um, and so these two processing pipelines have been developed to address the lab's needs when he was doing a postdoc, um, but which I think is the dream of everyone who's developing open source tools. They now have like a great user base. I don't want to delve too much because this is not my talk, but actually Mario, so I want to <laughs> give the floor to you. So if you want to share your screen and tell us about Kilosor, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Andre, and um, all the other organizers of this talk series for inviting me. Um, okay, this is actually going to be the last. Um, give you a rather big picture view of HeloSource. Um, it's an algorithm to um, analyze your raw electrophysiology data and group spike, detect spikes and group them into neurons so that you can do your science on them. Um, this Kilosort has been um, not just a single algorithm, but actually a, a series of uh, pipelines, let's say, composed of modules. All of those modules have um, developed and matured, you know, somewhat independently from each other, uh, as you'll, you'll see in a moment. Um, my goal for today is to kind of cover some of the basic principles of, of Kilosort, uh, especially the parts that, that stayed throughout the, the core of the algorithm. Um, and um, perhaps at the end, if there's time, uh, I will get into some of the latest uh, developments, which are uh, here in this region of 2.5 and, and version 3.0, which uh, was just released uh, a few months ago and is still in active uh, development. Uh, I will highlight these people uh, throughout the talk and at the end, um, these are some of the folks I, I work with. We don't do electrophysiology experiments ourselves to be cosmic imaging in the lab, uh, but we've got great collaborators, uh, Nick Steinmetz, Susu, Richard Gardner, um, that uh, give us lots of uh, a very good neuropixels data to um, develop these algorithms on. And I've also got some uh, great people helping you with the analyses um, and um, a team of software developers who've been helping me port Kilosort from its original MATLAB implementation to the Python version, which is essentially ready now. So um, this, this kind of Kilosort has started, um, as Andre has pointed out, when I joined Experimental Lab for the first time, 
you know, as a theorist, I learned that, you know, data comes from somewhere. Um, I was used to just getting nicely clustered spikes uh, and, and analyzing those with respect to the experiment. Um, and I didn't think too much about how that data was produced. Joining an experimental lab um, kind of let me look under the hood. There were problems with spike sorting. Um, one of the biggest problems was that it was still a fairly manual process at the time in 2016, 17, 15. Um, and there were these uh, great devices coming along, Neopixels probes, uh, which were being developed and tested in, in uh, the Carandini Harris lab at, at UCL, as well as at Junilia, at the Allen Institute, and a few other places uh, around the world. Now, because these devices have so many channels to record new activity from, uh, it meant that you know manually spike sorting data was not really feasible. And even like semi-automated approaches where you run a spike sorter and then kind of fix its mistakes, even those would have taken you know literally hundreds of hours uh, for maybe just a few experiments. Um, and so that was clearly not sustainable. Um, the, the postdoc in the lab, Nick Steinmetz, who's now faculty at the University of Washington, uh, has been kind of the main person testing these, who I worked with uh, closely to develop Kilosort with. Um, and he, you know, was getting so good at these um, that he was able to do things like eight probes, simultaneous neuropixels experiments, all eight simultaneously inserted into uh, a head fixed mouse brain. Uh, and so you can imagine if one experiment's got eight probes and each probe requires like 10 hours of manual curation, that's um, very quickly would, you know, drive you crazy trying to spike sort all that data. Um, and you want to spike sort all that data, right? And because, you know, this is like really valuable data. Uh, by the way, it's freely available online if you want to play with it. Um, we release all of our data with, with our papers. This one was showcased in this bottom paper here, Stringer by Kitsari et al. Uh, it produces, you know, beautiful spike rasters like this. Um, you know, I'll just let this wash over you. I want to explain exactly what it is. Lots of different brain areas recorded all at the same time, all sorts of interesting oscillations and patterns of neural activity going on. Uh, mouse is transitioning between um, kind of uh, being very aroused and, and being very stationary, you know. We, we want to be able to get the data like this very quickly and kind of, you know, hopefully minimize the process of, of, of spike sorting, or at least the human involvement in the process of spike sorting so we can focus on the science. So I'm going to, um, and, and that's where Kilosor sort of comes, comes in, right? Um, now I'm going to give you a kind of user centric view uh, a little bit. Uh, here, if you install Kilosort, which right now you would have a choice between the MATLAB and Python version, they both have a GUI uh, that looks kind of like this. And if you kind of set up and configured your recording correctly, giving it a nice channel map of, of channel positions in, in X, Y, Z space, um, and a few other uh, you know, probe specific parameters, uh, you get to see a picture like this on the right, which is from a Neuropixels probe. Um, it's a, it's an image. Um, it has 384 channels on the y-axis and a very short period of time on the x-axis, something like um, 50 milliseconds or so. Uh, and you can see that along this probe, which is going through many different brain areas, like visual cortex and the hippocampus underneath, um, there's all sorts of like interesting activity going on. Uh, all sorts of kind of little events happening all over the place. Uh, and those events are really um, what we need to detect and, and classify as spikes from different neurons. Now, there's a first step in, in Kilosort that involves a, a spatiotemporal filter to remove some of the um, essentially background chatter of neurons that are kind of not individually isolated. Uh, but still contribute to the, the, the background uh, in these recordings. So this is things like LFP, but also kind of fairly high frequencies in the LFP that can affect the spike sorting. After that, the, the, it looks a little bit less recognizable, but 
Uh, now, the only thing that's, that's there are going to be these events. Um, and if we can see things like this, then uh, we know that the recording is, is configured well and we're ready to you know, press the spike sorting button. And once we've run the spike sorting, um, we, we, in the GUI, you get a picture like this, which is a reconstruction of that data with templates. Um, and I'm showing you this picture, not just because it's, it's one of the first things you'll see if you run uh, Kilosor, but also because it um, really explains how the algorithm works. Um, if I go back and forth between this kind of fairly noisy picture, but that has like little events everywhere, uh, you'll see that you know this, the second one is essentially a, a cleaned up version, a denoised version of the first one. And importantly, I, I made this picture by um, using a, a neuron's essentially identity to put a little template, let's say, of this neuron here. You know, Achillosaur has detected that this neuron fires at this time, uh, and it has uh, computed a single template for this neuron, which is its spatiotemporal waveform. So every time this little neuron fires, it should always, um, you know, produce the, the same waveform. And so if we look kind of further to the left, we see a, another little thing that's probably the same neuron that has fired here. Look to the right, we might recognize another one. Um, that might have not been such a great example. Maybe like this one here is more clear. So here's one spatiotemporal event that's very similar to this one because they're from the same neuron. Uh, and Kilosort uses the same template or average waveform to model both of those spikes. Um, and if we look now at the difference between the raw data and the reconstruction, ideally we should see essentially just noise because if, if we're capturing all the events, um, but if there's anything left in there, um, then perhaps that's, that's somewhere where a unit hasn't been detected or um, something isn't working great. So it's again, a, a way to quickly check that that the spike sorting um, has worked. Um, you, you don't want this picture to be, to still have lots of spikes left in it. So now that I've, I've, I've given you a little sense of um, the first things you'll see when you, when you try to set up a kilo sort and run it, um, here's a kind of an overview of what's happening under, under the hood as kilo sort is analyzing data. It's the pre-processing step. Um, which you have kind of just seen, removes some of this background noise that, that, that uh, we don't care about. Um, now, this one has essentially two big steps. So the first one is the one I've shown you, spatial temporal filtering. It's been there from the beginning. It's a well-established um, step. Um, then there is the drift correction part, which is also uh, pre-processing, but it's a, it's a more recent development in Kilosor 2. 2.5 and, and 3. And I will talk about this step in quite some detail because we found it's one of the uh, most important things to do if we want to have um, almost you know, fully automated spike sorting. Now there's a clustering step. Uh, so this is once you have your spikes, you need to group them or cluster them into different um, units or different neurons. Um, and this follows a fairly, let's say, typical model for how you might do and how you might solve any clustering problem. Um, you can see many of the steps were there from KiloSort1. You know, there's some initialization of these clusters. Um, there's some, um, for KiloSort, we also have to recognize the amplitude of a neuron. Um, so the amplitude of, of that cluster center, that can change. Uh, and that's one of the things that we model that over time that amplitude may be fluctuating. Um, then finally, we need to correct some of the mistakes of clustering. Clustering, you know, is a difficult um, MP complete problem that will easily um, get you into a local minimum. And uh, these kinds of moves where we merge splits, sorry, where we merge clusters that really are the same neuron and they were split by accident or we split clusters, that should have been two. Uh, these are the kinds of, um, kind of post hoc adjustments that we do in the algorithm. And then um, 
finally, in QSO3, actually, this, this whole model of, of how to do clustering has changed. I will not be talking much about it today because um, it's still quite a bit of a work in progress. Uh, although we have shared, I have shared the code very early on uh, to get the community's uh, feedback and uh, iterate based on community feedback. Now, the template matching part is something I will also describe in, in some detail shortly. Um, it allows us to resolve spike overlaps. So uh, if you might have two neurons with that are close together on a probe and they happen to fire um, at, at similar times, which you know just by chance that will happen every now and then, um, then you'll, you'll actually have overlaps of their spike waveforms and we need to be able to resolve those and template matching and, and template subtraction uh, is the way to do that. And then finally, there's, a, there's another post-processing step that just does more splits and merges and it does some unit classification to tell us if um, a neuron or a unit is in fact a good neuron uh, or it's a multi-unit activity, MUA, or maybe just some kind of background noise or, or electric noise, an artifact or something uh, that we picked up on the probe. Now, the core of, um, of KiloSort, at least when it was originally uh, released, has been this template matching step. Um, already we already discussed this a little bit. Um, templates are essentially signatures of a neuron. They are the spatiotemporal voltage deflections that a, a single spike event would produce when a neuron fires. Um, and if you have lots of these spike events, um, the good, good news, right, is that they tend to look very, very similar to each other. So that's why we're able to, to recognize neurons when they fire, because they have these very distinguishing signatures. Uh, and if we, you know, if we average a bunch of them, we can get nice, clean templates like this. Um, and you can see even if, you know, on the same channel, we might have, or on a similar set of channels, we might have many different neurons, but we can still tell them apart because they, they have different spatiotemporal signatures. And then the data, here's another view of the data in a slightly different color map from what you've seen before. This one's just gray. The previous one was, was red, blue. Um, and what we're going to do is we're gonna take these templates, run them across the data from left to right, or, no, it doesn't matter if it's from left to right, but across essentially the entire data and see where these templates match the shape of the data. And notice that I'm, I'm kind of interchangeably going between a picture of templates that's um, you know, a more classical electrophysiology plot with, with lines uh, and a picture of the voltage that's, that's actually a picture um, that's just, uh, um, you know, essentially every row is a different channel and the intensity uh, or the brightness of, the, of every pixel in this uh, image corresponds to the voltage. Um, the model that we use, so I, I, I keep bringing up this idea that we have a model that we're essentially applying to the data and using it to do you know, spike inference and template learning. These two steps are kind of um, repeat one after the other. We're modeling the voltage trace, which is just a two-dimensional array that has electrode as one dimension and time as the other dimension. We model this voltage trace as, you know, approximately some sum over all of the different spikes. So each one, you know, K runs over spikes. Now every spike is coming from a certain template, A, um, from a particular cluster that this spike is from. That cluster is just sigma of K for spike A. Um, and then we kind of just place this, you know, this, the, 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 this next part is just telling us to place this template at, uh, you know, time TK relative to the start of the recording um, and multiply it by some amplitude that can be different from, from spike to spike and add some noise. And this is it. This is our, our, our big picture model of uh, how we think the data was produced. 
And um, we're going to iterate in this model between doing uh, spike inference, which essentially means detecting these times t k and detecting the cluster sigma k, assuming that we have the, a model of the spike template. So we assume we're given a. So if we already know what these templates are, like I was you know pretending to know here, uh, then we can just run them over the image, and we can uh, that way we can do spike inference to detect where. Uh, those templates actually match the image. That gives us a time at which the templates match. And it gives us you know, the identity of you know, which template matched the best at that time. Um, because we're taking every single one of these templates, we're running it over the image. Um, and so you know, if, if one of these little, little spikes, little events is better explained by, essentially has a bigger dot product with a particular template, that is the um, cluster that we're going to assign it to. OK, so you know this is all the math I'm going to show you. Um, it doesn't really get much more complicated than this. It's, it's kind of by construction of a pretty simple model. Um, it's also not a terrible model of how the, the voltages are actually picked up on the electrode, um, assuming that the neurons are, are kind of fixed in time. The, and, but, and we're going to come back to that assumption uh, in a moment. That's, that's the drift correction part. I'm going to skip over these uh, benchmarks, the really pretty, pretty old benchmarks. Um, and instead, I'm going to get to the part of, you know, how do we know that this works on your own data? Right? Benchmarks are there to tell us how well spike sorting algorithms work. We can use them to maybe compare algorithms to each other. Um, the problem is that it's very difficult to know the ground truth in electrophysiology experiments because, um, you know, a ground truth essentially involves uh, something like patching a neuron simultaneously while recording with a silicon probe, and that's extremely tedious and, and laborious, um, and in the end, not even very representative of, of real recordings. And so, you know, maybe. Given that, uh, maybe a more important question is to try to determine how we know if it worked um, on our own data, because that's what we really care about. Um, and that's what uh, phi is for. Let's see, I should have, so I don't have uh, a link here to phi. Phi is another great open source piece of software that was being developed in parallel with Kilosort by Cyril Rosant uh, in Paris. Um, and uh, he essentially uh, makes all these very nice visualizations for us that take the output of kilosort um, and kind of plot it in, in various ways so we can decide uh, if some neurons are in fact real neurons or uh, noise or something and, and maybe kind of fix uh, things uh, if necessary. And here what's being shown is you know one of the ways you might check if someone if if one of these units is a real neuron is to look at um, the autocorrelograms which are shown for about ten neurons here on the diagonal, uh, and you expect to see a nice refractory period which you do see a, a period where there's kind of after a spike there, there's no no chance you're going to see another spike uh, again very soon, uh, and you know once you get familiar with, with, with these kinds of recordings, you know what to look for, you know that, that this, is, this is good. This, this makes you feel good when you, you see these kind of fairly clean autocorrelograms. You look at the waveforms, you know, in some cases you can have lots and lots of um, neurons on the same channels. Uh, you know, different colors here are just different waveforms from different neurons, um, but you can see that they can be nicely distinguished just based on features, you know, they might be different on one channel, but maybe not on the other one. Uh, that's why it's so important to have uh, a fairly dense sampling of, of channels simultaneously. Um, I will, again, skip There's There's a lot more pictures like this you can produce from, from the Phi GUI. I encourage you to uh, check it out. Maybe invite the Phi developer for one of these series. Um, it's, a, it's a very well thought out uh, visualization tool for um, especially for these kinds of very dense um, neuropixels-like recordings. Okay, I'm going to skip over through this. And um, here, you know, I I, I think um, 
I'm going to skip over this too. You know, you know, how do you become an expert spike sorter? Where I mean, I think everyone who needs to do spike sorting does become an expert spike sorter. Uh, it just takes time. It, it takes some um, getting used, getting to know your data, um, and um, it takes some getting to know the tools that are available to you, the software tools like KiloSort and Phi, uh, and getting to know some of their features and um, perhaps, you know, looking over these kinds of users guides that we have um, for Phi, uh, we have uh, some wiki, um, some, some wiki uh, for KiloSort as well. Um, so there's all sources of kind of information online about what to do, but at the end of the day, you always have to go apply these to your data and just spend quite a bit of time with uh, one of your data sets. At this point, I, I'm going to take a break and take some questions, perhaps, if there are any available. I see something in the chat there. Nope. No question. I, I can just... Sorry, just a moment. There is a question on YouTube. Um... So the question is from Amir, like how do you choose how many channels to use to make a template? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. Um, the um, short answer is we always use as many channels. You know, we basically use an upper bound on the number of channels, right? So if you look here, you might say, oh, I'm only showing 12 or 10 channels. Um, in reality, these are just, 10 out of a maximum, I think, of 32. That's the default. Um, and 32 is just chosen to be an upper bound. Essentially, a channel that's not really, doesn't contain your neuron will just have a flat template there. Like if you look at this one here, for example, this neuron is really only big on two channels and pretty small on the other ones. Um, but you know, we, we don't throw out those channels. We don't need to. Uh, it just comes out flat and it doesn't bother uh, our spike story. Were there other questions? Uh, yes. So how dense the sites need to be for KiloSOR to work effectively? Um, so this is, you know, this isn't necessarily a question just for KiloSOR, right? It's a question for spike sorting in general. Um, and it is a question that we don't have, a, you know, a definitive answer to. Uh, Nick Steinmetz is in fact, uh, and, and, and some other collaborators in the NeuroPixel Consortium there, uh, developing probes that are extremely dense with a, something like five um, micron spacing as opposed to the 20 micron spacing that we have on NeuroPixels devices. Uh, and the goal of testing those very dense probes is to see just how dense it has to be for us to really detect uh, all, of the, all of the neurons correctly. Um, I, I would say that, um, you know, the choice for NeuroPixels was, you know, it, it, it's a pretty good one, uh, especially for the 2.0, the, the uh, site spacing has gone down to 15 microns now vertically. Um, and that I think is, uh, is in a really nice sweet spot, right? For having lots of coverage with many channels uh, while also having at least, I don't know, from three to 10 channels per neuron or so. Okay, um, there is another question, which is, what is the source of drift which you're correcting in your algorithm? Let's get to that. Uh, that's going to be the second part of, of my talk now. Okay. Um, there are There is one more question. I don't know if you wanna, actually there Go are coming, like, more and more questions. Um, so Carla is asking, will a channel map change the overall template waveform generated by the algorithm? No, the channel map is just the property of the probe um, and it just lets KiloSort know roughly uh, which channels to group together, which, which ones are close together that they should have um, spikes over both of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then there is more of a user question here from Marcos. Uh, can I use KiloSort too with tetrodes? I try to use it um, and I can, and I'm not able to, do, to get it to work due to the construction of the map of the electrodes. However, it is possible with KiloSort 1. Do you have any suggestions? Um, that's, that sounds like the, the kind of question we should uh, talk about on GitHub. Um, 
it sometimes you know different people have different configurations for their electrodes or tetrodes drives or whatever um and you know it it there there are a few tricks that that you need to be aware of but uh, i'd be happy to um to take that up on github yeah so just for completion we did put the link to github on the chat on the youtube chat marcos so you can click there and then file an issue uh, on GitHub. Thank you. Uh, then Elisa is asking, is KiloSort already available in, Py in Python? If so, could you mention where? Thanks a lot, I guess, on GitHub. But Marius, is it already available in Python? Yes, it is uh, up to version. Uh, so we actually, you know, we have some catching up to do with the Python version. We're about to release the 2.0 version. Uh, and very quickly after that, we're going to release the 2.5 version, which I think is the one that most people are using now. Uh, the 3.0 version is still pretty experimental. Um, so, you know, I, I recommend to anyone to just start from 2.5 um, and, and see how well that works for them. Okay, I think this was this thread of questions for now. Thank you. Great. All right, good. So um, let's see. Okay, so the way I had this talk structured, right, is we would kind of, what you saw there, the, 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 this template matching business uh, is something that we've had from the beginning. We knew it was important to have this kind of model of the data in order to be able to extract overlapping spikes. Uh, and then in KiloSort 2, the, the main problem we knew we had to solve was drift correction because one of the biggest sources of essentially noise in the recording is that the electrode is moving up and down as, as over time, sometimes on fast time scales, sometimes on slow time scales. Perhaps it's, it's more of a problem in uh, you know, acute recordings, head fakes, um, but it can definitely be a problem in, in freely moving animals too. I'll, I'll show you an example of that in, in rats um, at the end of this talk. And so, you know, this is, is, it has taken us years, you know, literally years to recognize just how big of a problem this is and, and how it's kind of, it's the source of the biggest errors we have in spike sorting. Um, but, you know, once you recognize you have a problem, you go and you try to fix it. Um, and, you know, we've been essentially fixing it ever since um, for the past several years, different versions of fixing drift. Um, we, we, we've pushed them to different versions of KiloSort. Uh, we're pretty happy with the latest one. So I will not be telling you, you know, the version from 2018. I'm going to move here pretty quickly because we don't have that much time either. This is how you might recognize that you have drift without actually computing any drift correction output uh, is you see that your amplitude of your neuron is fluctuating over time. That's, that's a short tail sign of drift. Uh, so these are just three units from the same recording effect. You can see, you know, the top one only kind of fluctuates on slow time scales, about an hour of recording. Second one kind of faster, and the third one even faster time scales. Um, it can be a problem when you've got, you know, the probe moving up and down. You can also think of it as the neurons moving up and down, right? If if we imagine it's relative motion and we imagine the probe is stationary. Um, and so if we have some, you know, here are four example spikes. Uh, here's a nice multi-channel spike that we see on know, about 10 channels or more, in fact. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of these small spikes that we might only see even on one channel um, or maybe more commonly on, on two, three, four channels. And these small spikes, as you might imagine, as the probe moves up and down, these small spikes are going to be translating up and down as well they're gonna start falling in between channels so that we might not even pick them up, but they will for sure change their waveform as the probe is moving up and down. And so we've gotta be able to fix this. Um, the, the actual, the, the drift tracking was the algorithm we came up with initially. It worked fine, especially for fairly short recordings, 30 minutes to an hour, but it, it started to fail beyond that. And so I'm going to skip this tracking algorithm. It was literally a sequential tracking of neurons. It worked pretty well. It allowed us to really improve on the, um, let's see, can I make this disappear? 
It allows us to really improve in, our, in some of our tests, our benchmarks. Um, you know, it allows us to, to when, when the simulation had drift, KiloSort one, and as well as another algorithm, um, didn't do very well. It didn't find lots of units correctly. But when we use KiloSort two, it has a model of drift correction. It did pretty well. It found almost all of the units. Um, however, as I was as I was saying, that wasn't um, you know we we improved on that version of drift correction, um, and the way. You know, it, it sometimes would have catastrophic failures like this, which is something that a, a tracking algorithm tends to do. For example, you might track this yellow unit throughout time, and then you get to this point and kind of it disappears for a moment for whatever reason. You know, maybe the neuron was just quiet for a bit. Maybe there was some sudden movement of the probe. Uh, and, and, you know, even, even if the problem was just a, a small event, um, you can't kind of recover from those kinds of um, um, problems when you when you're using a tracking algorithm. Um, so instead of that, we took some inspiration for calcium imaging, where movement is in fact a pretty big problem. You can see on the left is a, a standard kind of calcium imaging movie as an awake mouse head fixed is is running on a floating ball, and you can see quite a bit of, of motion. And then after data registration, everything is nice and, um, and, and stationary. And we essentially, you know, uh, the way this works is you have a reference frame, you have a single frame and you kind of slide the frame over the image. Sorry about problems. Hmm. All right, let's just keep going. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's kind of, that was our inspiration. It's a good thing that, you know, we happened to be working on, on these calcium imaging problems as well, because um, it, you know, at least conceptually, it was pretty similar. There's some issues with just doing registration on electrophysiological data. Uh, namely, we have many fewer pixels uh, compared to calcium imaging. So that could be a problem. The features that we're trying to match are, are fairly transient, whereas uh, we have some nice persistent images when we're aligning G-Camp movies, such as the baseline of, of a neuron or kind of blood vessels and, and just lots and lots of features to align to. Um, and also the geometry was the problem too, which is, you know, your calcium imaging, you'd have a nice uniform grid, uh, but with neuropixels, you actually have a, a checkerboard of, of sites. Um, and different probes can also have different geometries too. Now, this very last problem is something that um, thankfully was solved in an iteration of NeuroPixels called NeuroPixels 2.0. Um, these devices, you know, but were developed by a consortium of made of almost the same um, people and just recently published. They will be available again, like, like NeuroPixels 1.0 is now kind of freely available to anyone um, at, at kind of at production cost. So we'll near pixels 2.0, hopefully very soon. And the improvement is that, uh, well, there's a bunch of improvements that I'm, I'm not gonna go over. You know, That's yet another kind of open source neuroscience project that uh, it would be great if you guys had a, a talk on. Um, but from the point of view of spike sorting, what this did is it kind of nicely aligned the sites for us into two columns and it decreased the, sp the vertical spacing between sites. And what that does is it produces these very nice spikes that are kind of great for uh, drift correction in this vertical dimension, right? As the probe is moving, you know, each one of these neurons in different colors, you can see it has quite a bit of sampling in the Y dimension. And so there's no longer this kind of um, a risk that uh, a neuron would be lost in between waveforms because we're, we're sampling it enough in the Y dimension. Uh, and we're able to actually also figure out how the spike changes shape um, as uh, it moves up and down uh, due to drift. All because of this fairly dense sampling. And in fact, we went further. We did an experiment to try to test how good our drift correction was. Uh, and by we, I mean Nick. Um, who 
uh, did the experiment where he inserted one of these probes into a mouse brain uh, and he used the, the manipulator to uh, move the probe up and down with a sinusoidal motion, fairly slow motion. And you can see the outcome of that probe movement here in this plot. This is a what we now call a drift plot. Uh, the y-axis are is the depth. Every dot is a spike. The y-axis is depth. The x-axis is time. This is a fairly long section, an hour or so of a recording. Um, and uh, the um, intensity of the of the dot, so how black it is, uh, that indicates the amplitude of that spike. And so. You know, because high amplitude spikes tend to be fairly, you know, well isolated from the rest of the background, you can kind of trace a neuron as it's moving up and down vertically in the vertical dimension. Uh, and you can see that th this is happening, especially here in this period where, where Nick moved the probe with the manipulator to essentially create test data for us to test our drift correction algorithms. And so, I will go over the details of, of how this works. Um, it's all in the science paper, that, that, that uh, neuropical science paper that was just published. So you can uh, go and look at the details over there. Um, here's our estimate of this manipulator movement and as well as the estimate outside of that period. You can see there's still movement even when Nick doesn't move the probe, right? That's, that's the thing we're trying to correct. It's the normal, you know, electro movement you might expect in your experiment. Um, and we're detecting it pretty, we're detecting the imposed motion pretty well here. Um, now, once we detect it, we can reinterpolate the data to essentially shift it back um, to kind of flatten it out um, and, and make it stationary through time. Um, and remember, NeuroPixels 2.0 has this very nice high density. Uh, in, in the y direction, uh, which is what allows us to uh, interpolate it pretty well. Now, the exact choice of interpolation method is a, is a whole other you know, thing we have to think about. We went with uh, Kriegian interpolation in the end. You can read about it in the paper. Uh, and now if you look at our drift plots after correction, so this is before correction, after correction, I'll go back and forth a few times. You can see, you know, we've we've pretty much straightened out most of the probe. There's some section towards the top, especially where you can see there's some motion left that we haven't corrected. It's because we use rigid registration. We applied the same rigid shifts at all levels in the probe. Um, we can fix that. You know, different parts of the probe might move slightly differently. So we develop a non-rigid registration approach where we um, split the probe into different subsections, estimate drift separately for each of those subsections with a different color, uh, and then apply the drift, uh, kind of reinterpolate the data in a, in a way that's uh, fixing different amounts of drift at different places on the probe. And again, that's the, the section with the imposed manipulator drift. Uh, and now if we look at the result after non rigid registration, you can see even that top motion here is kind of disappeared now. Um, everything is, is more or less stable. And here's again the original. Oops. Okay, you can't really see it going back and forth. Uh, the rigid registration, remember, had, had this remaining uh, drift at the top, which, which we were able to fix with the non rigid ray. All right, so that's, you know, um, that's basically how the drift correction works. We've got a bunch of benchmarks to, to estimate how well this works. I'm not gonna go over them, but the, the bottom answer is it, it's really good. And um, if you look at your units in phi after drift correction, they will kind of be more nicely tightly aligned. The spikes will be more nicely tightly aligned to each other because we've kind of, we fixed this kind of vertical offset from drift that might make even spikes from the same unit, right, look uh, quite a bit different from each other. And here's those benchmarks I was talking about. Uh, go look at them in the uh, in the science paper. All right. Um, okay. So now we've got you know even these kinds of wildly fluctuating neurons. We can track them throughout uh, entire you know in this case almost two hour long sessions. It's pretty good. We have examples in the paper of chronic tracking 
um, over multiple days of using NeuroPixels 2.0 with, with a similar algorithm as the one I've, I've described before. Um, we have an example of kind of freely moving rats over periods of five hours or so in this case, as you can see, um, where they go from, from sleeping to an open field arena um, to, I think, you know, there's some resting period in here. There's, there's many different states uh, some of them involving, you know, quite a lot of locomotion and you know, head bumping and that kind of stuff. Uh, and you can see that the electro drift is actually still pretty large. Um, I don't have a scale bar and why, I apologize for that, but uh, it's on the order of tens of microns, um, you know, very similar to what we were seeing in uh, the awake recordings, even though this is a chronic implant. Um, okay, good. So I, I'm not going to go too much into this. We've got another, yet another module right at the end. We, we try to replace as many things that humans do as possible, right? So that it's as automated as possible. And one of those is, is calling units, uh, whether they're good or they're MUA or they're noise. Um, and so you can, we developed a, a little deep neural network to solve that problem for us um, using a, a freely available data set from Nix. Let me move this again. Uh, from Nick's 2019 paper, where he shared a lot of manually curated data. So we had a lot of training data for this algorithm. Works pretty well. Um, you can pause, <laughs> you can pause and, and look at exactly, you know, how well it works, but basically it works pretty well. I don't have time to go into these details. Um, the final part of this talk um, was going to be about data visualizations. Um, but I think I'm running out of time and I'd rather uh, get more, more questions from uh, the audience. So I'll be skipping over the, the details of, the, of how we compute the visualizations and just, just kind of show it to you. I think it'll be pretty clear. So let's say, you know, you've just gone onto your rig to do an experiment and you've collected two minutes of data with a NeuroPixels 1.0 probe um, and you kind of want to know where the neurons are. Well, actually, we have this nice little algorithm that's essentially one step of kilosort. It's not the whole thing. It's just one step um, that detects spikes and assigns them to a two-dimensional xy position on the probe. So you can see the x position here is on the y-axis. The y position is on the x-axis. And the probe has been split into three segments. So these three segments just go on top of each other. You can see the probe is going from thalamus to hippocampus to visual cortex. Um, and what you can see right away, right, is there are these nice little well-isolated clusters that are, of course, uh, neurons that um, where there's, there's, there's lots of well-isolated spikes in the same place. Um, and, you know, this kind of lets you get a sense of where your area borders are, um, you know, where you have good activity or, or not so good. Um, maybe you can play a stimulus for two minutes, see where you're driving lots of neural activity um, with, with this kind of a simple visualization like this can, can allow you to do that um, and, and get a sense of, of what you see on the probe. With more time, 20 minutes, you know, it, things start to like really come out uh, as, as kind of nice, nicely shaped clusters. You can see here very tightly packed next to each other, for example, in the, I think this is in the thalamus. You can color individual spikes based on the events, let's say amplitude in this case. So just how high was the amplitude of that spike? You can see individual clusters. They tend to be made of similarly amplitude spikes as you might expect. You can color them by the width of the spike, which uh, as you might know is an, oops, an indication of whether you might be dealing with a fast spiking neuron with a short waveform. So you can see here in visual cortex, there's a few of those, those are kind of candidate um, part of albumin positive cells. Um, and that's it, yeah, and okay. And so now there's the kind of the visualization that I made for kilosort three, although I could have made it for any version of kilosort. It just kind of shows you how the algorithm is extracting different clusters. And it, again, I, I flipped the order, the, the, the dimensions again here so that y-axis is now indeed the y-dimension. Um, but it, it's just meant to illustrate that 
you know, the same the spikes of the same random pseudo random color are from the same cluster, the same unit, probably neuron. Um, and you can see there, you know, there's quite a bit of overlap, and we can do a pretty good job of, of, of separating those. With that, I'd like to uh, I'll leave this this summary up um, for questions and discussion. I'd like to thank the people that helped me with this work, again, uh, as well as my my funders, uh, primarily my Janelia now, um, where I uh, live and work. Um, so why don't we uh, take a whole lot of questions now? Thank you very much, Marius, for this talk. This was amazing. Um, people who have questions, please, now is the moment to ask them. Um, somebody in the Zoom room might have a question that you want to voice, or you can also just write it in the chat. Um, and I guess while people warm up to ask their questions, I would like to ask one myself, yep. if you don't mind, which is, um, I mean, this thing with the drift correction, right? Like this. This looks amazing. And I was wondering how fast can you do this? Is this something that you guys are thinking about implementing in real time so that you could use for things like machine computer interfaces or things like that? Or is that too computationally intensive to do something like that? Um, well, it's not computationally, it's not too intensive. It, it shouldn't be a problem. However, mm -hmm. there is a problem with the amount of data you need to estimate drift over over what you know like when we estimate drift we usually do it in batches of two seconds each now in two seconds with a neuropixel probe you might have something like you know five or ten thousand spikes now that's a really good sample to work with in order to estimate the drift very precisely now if you were trying to estimate drift from one spike it would be very difficult because um you have a bit of a chicken and egg problem. You, you detect a spike, you don't know what cluster it's coming from. It could be coming from you know, this cluster, let's say you know, at the same level as the spike, uh, or it could be coming from a cluster that's a little nearby, but the probe has moved. And that's why you know, it's, the spike is now at, at that level. Um, and so for, with a single spike or, or just a few of them, there's not enough information to estimate drift very well. Um, there's some minimum number that we haven't really computed, but uh, I suspect that would be the, the main limitation uh, in terms of kind of pushing that window down to, to be, you know, something more like 10 milliseconds or at most a few tens of milliseconds, which is what you would need if you mm -hmm. were to correct the data for um, real-time interfaces for, for, let's say, brain-computer brain interfaces. Okay. Um, okay, so there are, thank you very much for that. That's interesting. So I guess, I mean, maybe this is just a comment, but if you then eventually have like a very dense neuropixel probe, you could shorten that time down because then you have like more spikes for the same amount of time or not? Well, you also need a lot more, many more channels, right? That's, that's yeah. kind of what you need. The, the more dense neuropixels probes, they trade off um, mm -hmm. density you know, you can have larger density, but you can, can't can really increase the number of channels yet because that's a kind of fundamental limitation of how many wires you can lie down the probe. Uh, mm -hmm. And in the first two versions of NeuroPixel, that has remained fixed to 384. Um, there's some progress, I think, in the direction of increasing that a little bit, maybe to a thousand, but it's, it's not gonna go much beyond that. So, the number of channels will kind of always be a, a, a limitation there. Okay, thank you. So we have a bunch of questions now. Um, Torfis is asking a uh, general question, any specific hardware requirements for Kilosor? Do you do I need a GPU? Do you have any recommendations? Yeah, so I forgot to mention this, but yes, you would need a GPU, uh, an NVIDIA GPU in fact, to take advantage of the CUDA um, language, which is where Kilosor is written in. Um, there we have a, a specific page on the on the wiki that um, kind of gives you recommendations about hardware. Um, it's often the case that people kind of you know build a workstation for kilo sorts um, that they might be able to use for other things too. Um, 
because you know it's it it it's you know it's using kind of consumer uh, products that tend you know to be very expensive. Well, in this period, it's a little tough to get a GPU because there's a global um, shortage um, of, of these chips. So maybe just wait a little. Okay. Um, then Amir is asking, the spike form of some burst in neurons change during the burst. Would the algorithm be compatible with that change? Yeah, so, you know, we've looked a little bit at that. And um, so first, you know, during a burst, one of the main things that happens is that, you know, the first neuron may have a large amplitude and then the first spike may have a large amplitude and the second, third, fourth, the amplitude might, might go down a bit. Um, and that's something that we do take into account into the algorithm. Now, there's a second change during a burst, which is that spikes also tend to get longer in time, uh, which is not something we account for. However, we have looked at it a little bit. Um, and, you know, the amount by which the waveform changes really isn't, um, you know, so large compared to some of these other problems, like the amount that changes due to drift. Um, so, you know, we, we have not tackled that. And, haven't really found it necessary. Haven't found any good examples where um, the spike sorting failed because of bursts. Okay, thank you. Um, Misha is now asking, is drift correction important for permanently implanted electrodes, for example, tetrodes, or is the drift between different between head fixed and freely moving recordings? Yeah, good question. So I, I showed you a little bit of a neuropixels implant here that was in a freely moving rat. This is from um, the Moser lab. Where is it? Um, so the quick answer there is that neuropixels, chronic implants actually tend to still move quite a bit. I think this can depend a lot on your prep, but uh, you know, I think these guys know what they're doing. So I, mm. I, think, I think this is one of the better scenarios. Now, it is possible, right, that tetrodes versus silicon probes implanted chronically might also behave differently. I've, I've heard that from, from some folks. Um, a lot of tetrode people seem very confident that their recordings are stationary, but uh, it's actually pretty hard to know, right? Because if you only have a tetrode, right, four electrodes, you're not getting this kind of nice vertical sampling uh, to be able to know if, you're, if your tetrode moved or not. So, you know, you might have a problem and you might not know it, which is the worst kind of problem. Um, you know, that, that said, I think everyone is, is kind of familiar with their data to a level, you know, just um, probably good to, to always take a, a, a second look, um, especially since some of the, these methods we've introduced can help you see some of the drift that you might not have been able to see before. Cool, great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna, so there are two more questions. One from Ida that asks, uh, are, the are, the visual sorry, are the visualizations you showed at the end freely available yet? So can you access them? Can you use them? Or That's a good question. They, I haven't pushed them into the repository, but I do plan to do that. Um, they will be there. In fact, I haven't even been able to find my code. I was trying to find it before this talk to make some new figures, but <laughs> I'm sure it's somewhere on, on my computer. <laughs> um, but... Um, Yes, they, they, they will be included. You know, uh, you know. I, sorry, sometimes I forget what I have pushed and what I haven't. This is in fact there. So if you just want to make um, this picture, you are able to based on the most recent KiloSort 3 version. Okay, great. So Ida, I hope that you'll find this on GitHub on KiloSort 3. And yeah. now for the next question we have at the moment uh, from Marcos, uh, which is, Working with many tetrodes, if you have a noise which looks similar to a spike and it appears in every tetrod, is Kilosor 2 able to recognize it as a noise um, and avoid clustering it, figuring out that it appears also in other tetrodes? Yeah, well, this tends to be a common problem where there, there can be fairly high frequency deflections that are common across electrodes. Um, we deal with this with a kind of common average referencing method, which essentially means just subtracting something like the, the mean or median voltage across channels. It deals with some of the worst cases uh, of what the, um, some of the worst cases of, of such shared noise. 
Um, with tetrodes, I know that, you know, there's, there tends to be more noise than, than common, especially, you know, kind of head bumps and stuff like that. Um, so there, there, there would be a few cases we I have wrestled with in the past trying to, to solve them that might be, you know, beyond solving. Okay, thank you. I think that, yeah, um, answers the final of our questions. If anybody else has a question, this is the moment or forever hold your peace. Uh, or actually later contact Marius over GitHub. And is there a forum or a place where people can ask things and interact with other people using uh, KiloSort? Uh, I've kept it all on GitHub for now. Okay. Uh, there is, okay, there's a Slack channel. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go to neural methods, I yeah. think that's the workspace and there's a channel on there that's uh, especially for KiloSort. Uh, yeah. And I, I check it every now and then, but there, you know, there's quite a few people there. So if you post there, you might get an answer pretty, pretty soon. Yeah, okay, great. So we can drop the link for the neural method Slack for those of you who are not there yet. It's really recommended because there are like 7,000 at least, I think, neuroscientists there. And actually we have a couple of more questions if you don't mind um, answering yeah. them. Um, so Fiamma is asking, I'm working with data recorded with non-commercial tetrodes. And mapping them is a bit difficult. I was wondering how much influence has the Y coordinates and X coordinates in the clustering, or if it matters more, indicate which channels belong to the same tetrode. Yeah, so for tetrodes, you should, um, because of exactly this problem that you mentioned, that you don't know exactly the X, Y position of your, of your channels, um, which you can never know with tetrodes, right? Um, then I recommend using KiloSort 2, uh, which is what I mentioned before. It has a drift tracking algorithm. It does not need a, a geometry model uh, in order to kind of interpolate data and, and shift it up and down. Um, it, it actually works quite a bit differently, uh, KiloSort 2. Um, it's not, I think it's not as good for, you know, like neuropixels. Um, but it should be in fact better for tetrode. So um, you'll go check that out. And that has its own ref set of references. If, uh, you okay. look on the wiki. So basically use KiloSort 2 and like this should help you. Uh, That's yeah. my recommendation for now. And you know, hopefully in the yeah. future, we'll be able to bring them back back together. But, but for now, mm. that's what I would do. Okay, so there's one more question, which is from Utku. Um, what do you suggest for the artifacts such as jumps or clips in the signal that can be observed in all channels? Any suggestions for excluding those time frames? Yeah, I mean, this is what I, I was mentioning before, right? That, that mm -hmm. sometimes, especially with, with freely moving animals, um, there can be some kinds of artifacts that are, are very hard to deal with. Um, in my experience, the, you know, if you can, yes, if you can, detect those periods and just set them to zero, um, that would be the way to go. Mm -hmm. You probably don't wanna, you know, even if you could kind of subtract out the artifact, you know, kind of still do spike sorting on it, uh, you might not want to use that data because, you know, it's during a period where your stability would be pretty poor and, you know, you don't wanna overinterpret data during such events. Um, but I think, and, and, you know, I've, I've, I've tried to think of, of, of ways to put such artifact detectors into KiloSort, but I think they're, they're so uh, unique to the different preps that people have uh, that you're probably better off making like a pretty good detector for yourself for your recordings, because you know what, what kinds of, you know, problems you have um, mm -hmm. rather than using a generic thing in KiloSort. Okay. Uh, we have one more question come in, so, and I think we can, like, not to extend too much and, and let Marius get back to work um, and not abuse his, his uh, time. Just ask this one and then ask all the other remaining, if people have more questions, to basically bring them to GitHub, I guess, or to Neuro Methods, as, um, as we brought up earlier. So the question is from Pierre. Um, so as manual curation is still required step after KiloSort for the remaining false positive or negative, would it be possible to consider the human expert curation to refine classifying algorithms? Uh, okay, so the answer to the first question is that it depends a lot on what probe you're using. 
and what kind of experiment you're doing. We have found in, in, in certain kinds of experiments with let's say, you know, neuropixels, either 1.0 or 2.0 um, that are kind of acute, two hours, maybe not a lot longer than that. Um, we've been pretty confident at using the automated output of kilosort without further curation. In other cases, um, you know, especially with other kinds of probes, you know, you, you, you might want to, um, to still do some curation. The other thing you might have to do is you might want to explore the parameter space of kilosort because, you know, I haven't worked a lot with data that's not neuropixels. So the right parameters for you might be a little different from what we you know, ship as default um, in the GitHub version. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think with that, we close um, the questions for our session. We'd like to say again, thank you very much for Marius to have make the time and space and for everyone who came and, and um, watched the talk and asked questions. It was really great. Thank you very much, Marius. And I hope it was uh, enjoyable for you too. Yeah, uh, this anyway. was great. Thanks awesome. for the invitation. Uh, you're welcome. We're, we're happy to, to highlight such tools here. Look uh, forward to, and, uh, to the future talks in the series. Yeah. Uh, we have actually next week, we have, uh, we, we shift a little bit from software that we have been doing in the last weeks to hardware again. And we're gonna see the Fed tree uh, which is an automated system to feed and, and count like activity from mice in their home cages from Alexei, uh, from the University of Washington, if I'm not mistaken. Um, nice. Yeah. So Sounds useful. Yeah. Join us next week. And thank you very much. And now we're going to close the uh, transmission. <laughs>